sorry, female first anatomy. Uh, as you know, to know what is abnormal, definitely, we need to know what is normal first. And uh, let us uh, go together through the breast anatomy and try to understand uh, what is uh, what is the normal structures of the breast anatomy and how it appear on imaging, and why we should know that uh, the related the adjacent structures, and uh, uh, because definitely we would like to know uh, if there is breast cancer, uh, how it is spread and extend to the adjacent structures and how we could appreciate this on imaging as early as possible and help the patients and the clinicians for the diagnosis and management of the patients. Okay, so as we mentioned before, the breast is a modified skin gland that develops from the mammary ridge in the embryo and it lies on the anterior chest wall between uh, below the clavicles down to six eight ribs and the breast tissue might be as far as medial to the sternum, far laterally to the mid-axillary line. These are important issues. We should know it. And breast tissue is frequently found in the axilla, occasionally reaching the apex. All these, it has the clinical significance. Yes, the breast usually is resting on the pectoralis and extending uh, from the second rib down to the six or, or, or seven ribs down from the lateral aspect of the sternum, okay, to the anterior axillary line. But it can extend far medial, as we mentioned here, to the midline, far medial, to the mid axillary line and up to the clavicles and even down. That is why while scanning the patient on ultrasound, okay, we should follow the breast and until the breast tissue is ending up to the clavicle, up to the midlines. You see down to the, uh, sometimes to the upper abdomen, okay, to the mid uh, axillary line and so forth. So, and as you know, the breast is resting on, uh, on the pectoralis muscles. And the, the pectoralis muscle fibers are running obliquely, you see? And the lateral aspect of the breast is rubbing lateral to the pectoralis muscles. What is the significance of that? Do you know the significance? What is the significance for us to understand this issue? Why we, we should know the relations of the, the breast to the pectoralis and this issue? Any, any, uh, any volunteer? Anyone knows the clinical significance for, for us as a radiologist? Okay. So while we are doing mammography, so we are doing mediolateral oblique rather than true lateral. See, by, by doing mediolateral oblique or uh, oblique lateral rather than true lateral, we, we are following the axis of the pectoralis. We ensure that this part of the breast is being included into the image. So it is important for us to know the breast. You see, uh, here is resting into the pectoralis and the relation to the pectoralis and relation to the other muscles. And below the pectoralis here is the serratus, is, is a, uh, uh, serratus anterior, the lower, uh, the lower third is resting uh, onto the serratus anterior laterally. You see lateral border is anterior axillary line and here is latissimus dorsi, you see, and superior as we mentioned, um, and inferior here. This is the inframammary ridge or inframammary uh, line, you see, inframammary fold by mean. Uh, usually it's about the six sevens rib and we mentioned medially into the sternum. So, okay, so just to emphasize on the 
associated uh, the muscles in relations to the breast again. The most important is the pectoralis muscle. Two thirds of the breast is resting onto the pectoralis while the lower uh, third is resting here into the serratus anterior. And this is important if the posterior uh, breast cancer, it will be close to these muscles and can directly infiltrate these uh, muscles. We have to know it while uh, interpreting uh, press imaging. Okay, and laterally here, this is the latissimus dorsi, you see, at the mid axillary lines, and inferiorly and medially here, there is external oblique and the rectus abdominis muscles. And sometimes this is, uh, yani, uh, due, uh, after mastectomy, they're using these muscles, the latissimus dorsi and these rectus muscles uh, in, the, in doing a flap, okay? And autologous reconstruction of the breast. Uh, we have to know the relations. Also, we need to know uh, what is the tail of a spins. We, we have axillary tail. This axillary tail sometimes extending too much into deep into the axilla, as seen here in this image. Compared to the other mammogram, if you look here, the breast tissue is ending here while I have another breast tissue here. And the difference between the two, this is an ectopic breast tissue while this is the tail of Spence. And here on mammography, it's okay. We are trying to cover it as a whole. Also, during doing press ultrasound, you have to pass your uh, transducer continuously without interruptions until the press tissue, you see, is completed. Uh, then go to, uh, up, up, up to the axilla, you see, to make sure there is no interruptions. Uh, between the, the breast apex and the axillary breast tissue to make sure if this uh, is the tail of spans or this an ectopic breast tissue seen into the axilla. And as the ectopic breast tissue we said before, like the regular breast, any changes occur in the regular breast is being uh, occur in the tail of spans or in this uh, ectopic breast. Uh, regarding the hormonal stimulations, it can be enlarged during pregnancy, can be get bulbable, uh, in, uh, fibrocystic, can be tender, and also cancer can arise in this uh, part of the breast tissue. So, okay. The breast is a modified cutaneous uh, exocrine gland, as we mentioned before. It composed of skin, subcutaneous tissue, breast parenchyma, and breast stroma. These illustrations of gross anatomy of a female breast. Here the breast is resting into the pectoralis major and the knees to which is pectoralis minor resting over the chest wall with intercostal muscles and ribs. And here, this is the skin, you see, and the central portion is nipple areolar complex with the ducts uh, passing uh, from the nipple back into the glandular uh, breast of parenchyma embedded into the, the fat, and these are uh, vessels. Okay. There are two uh, main subsections we want to uh, emphasize on. First is a breast composition and background textures. And the second is a technical issue. Regarding the background textures, we, we would like to know what, what is the appearance okay, of these component of the breast into the imaging. The glandular tissue we mentioned before, but just to repeat again, are radiopaque on mammography, hypochoic on ultrasound, intermediate to low on uh, MRI, uh, yani more or less, you see, ISO to the, um, the muscles on MRI. While both are a, we, while, um, yeah, 
while fibrous fibrous septum fibrous tissue is radioopaque you see uh, on M on mammography echogenic on ultrasound and intermediate also on mri these are fibroglandular tissue and this is the echogenic lines are fibrous fibrous tissue these are fibrous tissue on ultrasounds okay representing as echogenic lines so are wide both here and here and while the fat is radiolucent on mammography hypochoic on ultrasound while on mri is a hyper intense you see so it is dark dark on both and fibrous is bright on both okay regarding the technical issue our aim is to visualize the entire breast tissue as we mentioned before to image the chest uh, back to the chest wall posterior up to the clavicles lateral to the mid axillary line medial to the sternum and the most yani uh, the mo sorry the most uh, uh, important or the most helpful uh, uh, modality of the breast giving good anatomical coverage is breast MRI. As you have seen here, the breast MRI demonstrates the posterior lesions with not only the involvement of the pectoralis but also extending into the intercostal muscles. It can also show, you see, the adjacent structure like lung pleura and the uh, liver as well as uh, sometimes rest of the bones. On axial view we can see sometimes even the spines and the covering of the axilla. Okay, here this is the mammogram. You see, this is illustrations of the breast anatomy. Look here, the same structure seen on mammography. This is the nipples and this is the echogenic this is sorry this is the pride or the radio opaque lines is is, is the fibrous septum and the glands you see is opaque and the intervening fat is loosened the subcutaneous as well as fat lobule in between the parenchyma and the retromammary fat and this is the pectoralis muscles okay regarding ultrasound also the whole structures of the breast uh, down to the chest wall is supposed to be visualized while doing breast ultrasound. Here from the skin, you see the skin and these cobra ligaments extending from the, uh, the skin down through the, uh, the glandular parenchyma and this is the uh, uh, mammary zones and the glands, okay? And here, this is superficial, anterior layer of superficial and posterior layer of superficial fascia, retromammary zones, as well as the pectoralis muscles. And here, these are the ribs. MRI also, as we mentioned, it gives a good coverage from the nipples. This is the mammary uh, glands, you see here, and the of the internal memory vessels and the skins in the 3D maximum intensity projection post contrast and this is what is going on okay and here this is the non fat sat T1 image okay demonstrates the nipple and the glandular parenchyma as well as the surrounding fat uh, in the pre mammary zone post uh, retro mammary or retroglandular zones here around the skins and fat locule within the glands okay so we mentioned while describing the anatomy uh, zone uh, pre mammary zone and zone mammary zones and so representing 
the glands, okay? And the parenchyma, we have pre-mammary zones and we have post or retromammary zones. Here, this is the zonal uh, anatomy. You see the pre-mammary zones just anterior to the, to the glands, between the glands and the skin, and it represents the anterior subcutaneous fat. This is the pre-mammary zones. And this is the mammary zone see representing the gland and here posterior to each is a retromammary zone also representing just posterior to each is the pectoralis these are the vessels the skins you see the copper ligaments the nipples and the that fat lobule in between the parenchyma while in a fatty breast you see it's difficult to differentiate between the uh, the zones because the, the pre and retromammary zones are the pre and retromammary zones are fat when the uh, the glandular zones or the mammary zones also fatty the three layers it will be a fatty however here we could appreciate the inframammary fold as uh, one of the important structures a copper ligament and this is a superiolar nipple these are vessels and the skin this is a pectoralis and here is a lymph nodes. Okay, the mammary zones on ultrasounds, this is the subcutaneous fat, this is the pre-mammary zones, and as we mentioned, the gland is uh, more ecogenic, uh, the fibroglandular tissue is ecogenic, representing the mammary zones, and posterior to which there is a thin layer of also hypochoic fatty layers, which is the retromammary layers. It's uh, separable from the underlying uh, pectoralis muscles. But sometimes it's difficult to appreciate all these zones when the parenchyma is thick and occupying the whole breast with paucity of the fat. Here the subcutaneous fat is minimal as well as the retromammary fat is also very thin, the, vector, the breast is almost abutting, the pectoralis with very thin layers here, and these are the ribs. Okay, on MRI, as we mentioned before, this is the pre-mammary zones, you see, anterior to the gland, between the skin and the gland. This is the gland, is the mammary zones, and posteriorly, is retromammary zones and here this is the uh, the fat representing subcutaneous fat representing the pre-mammary zones and the fat posterior to the gland retromammary zones and this is the glandular tissue represent the mammary zones also we can appreciate here the pectoralis uh, major and minor muscles as well as the deep fascia uh, of pectoralis muscles and here this is the superficial layer of the superficial fascia covering the breast abutting the skin is sparing the nipple area okay so as we mentioned before the breast is developed within or investing within the two layers of the superficial fascia see the gland the mammary gland is seen between the superficial layer and the deep layer of the superficial fascia. This, the envelope, uh, uh, or encapsulating the breast, except for the nipple area, the layer is extending anteriorly, you see, enveloping the breast, and completed here in continuation with the posterior layer, which, you see, uh, separated from the deep uh, fascia covering the pectoralis by the retromammary zone. See, this is the retromammary zone separating it from the deep fascia. It is seen on uh, ultrasound as ecogenic layer. And here, as if it is giving a capsule in this digital mammography, you see, it is following the parenchyma here, this also bright layer because it is a connective tissue 
it is a fibrous, so it will appear on a, a mammogram as radio-opaque, on ultrasound as echogenic, and also here, if you see, it's continuous except for the nipple area. Okay, pre-mammary zones, as we mentioned, is uh, just a loose connective tissue and predominantly fat containing the uh, the anterior layer of the superficial fascia from which arising the cooper ligaments extending back. See? And as well as the posterior retromammary, both of which are uh, fatty components. See? Although fat, as we mentioned, although the fat in the body, in the whole body is bright, is echogenic, in the fat is appear as low compared with the echogenic uh, stroma, echogenic, uh, echogenic fibrous, uh, fibroglandular tissue. Okay, this is the, the most anterior, the subcutaneous fat or the pre-mammary zones. And usually the lesions seen in these areas are dermal, are subcutaneous lesions. However, sometimes uh, breast lesions and, uh, can be visualized here. But from my experience, I noticed that most of the lesions seen in this area, I could appreciate the uh, superficial layer of superficial fascia coming anterior to each, as if is anterior place pressed lesions extending into the subcutaneous. However, sometimes we might find it more anterior in a rare cases uh, due to uh, uh, migrations of the pressed tissue through the uh, cobra ligament into these areas. Regarding the pressed uh, the mammary zones, as we mentioned, this is representing the glands. Here, this is a superficial layer of the superficial fascia, and this is the deep layer of the superficial fascia. Both are echogenic, are involved the mammary zones. Anterior to which is the pre-mammary zones, and posterior to which is the retromammary zones, which is also seen here, you see? And this is the pride area, is the uh, corpus mammary, mammary or the mammary zones. Again, there are variations in the mammary zone depend on the breast involutions and the component of the breast tissue. If it is thicker, uh, the glandular, uh, fibroglandular tissue is thick, you see, so it will be a large zone, a large mammary zone. And if it is involuted pressed, it will be smaller zones. And this is a mammary zone here on MRI. See? And uh, it is, as we mentioned, it varies remarkably. And uh, usually, usually, the distribution even within the breast itself, it varies. If you notice here, the breast involuted here, this is lateral aspect. Still, there is residual parenchyma. Again, here, upper outer quadrant, usually, as we mentioned before, it composes more fibroglandular parenchyma. That is why, and the least uh, or latest area to be involuted, that is why it has the highest incidence of breast cancer. And these changes definitely it depends on the patient age, hormonal status, inherited parenchymal pattern, and many factors can affect this issue. The mammary zones is a zone of press pathology. Most of the press pathology is seen within the mammary zones. However, the retromammary zones you see, we mentioned before, it is an area or a thin layer, okay, of loose connective tissue and adipose tissue. That is why it appears as radiolucent on mammography, okay, and hypochoic on ultrasound. Uh, it's, it's considered as a forbidden areas for breast cancers. We have to consider that area and to search for breast cancer as seen in this case here. This is our case. You see there is a lesion posteriorly here 
and when when magnifying view it is it having a suspicious mammographic appearance also this is our case look for a small breast cancer here it is uh, it is easy to be missed due to the adjacent fat it is hypochoic and the fat is hypochoic there is no parenchyma so it is easy uh, uh, easy uh, missing breast cancer in this area and uh, this is called Ch uh, Chassian's fossa the area the retromammary area the other name for retromammary area is a Chassian's fossa as we mentioned is a forbidden area okay uh, considering the gross anatomy of the breast as we, we talked before, the breast is usually a complex structure and component is also complex. It contains, as we mentioned, glandular, connective tissue, blood vessels, nerves, but we are trying to simplify these and divide it into three parts to talk about each part separately, considering parenchyma, stroma, and the skin. Starting by the skin. Okay. The normal skin of the breast is thin. It is, it should not be more than two millimeter. It range from 0.5 to two millimeter in all imaging, in ultrasound, MRI, or uh, mammography. You see, but it's relatively thick on uh, at the base of the breast, and it is in younger patients. You see, and. Here, this is a skin on ultrasound. This is a skin on MRI. Look for the dependent portion. It's a little bit thicker, but it's still within normal. And demonstrate homogeneous, smooth enhancement, which is considered to be a normal. And the skin of the breast, like other skins, it has two layers uh, or three layers. The main two layers is epidermal layers, which is a very thin, superficial, it appears as echogenic lines on here. And uh, it's separa separating, uh, separating by, sorry, separate, uh, separated from the dermis by a thin uh, basement membrane. This, this is separated, this is the dermal layer and this is the basement membrane. And the dermal layer, you see, be, be, below the dermal layer is the hypodermis, which is a subcutaneous tissue. So, okay. Uh, here regarding the, this is a dermal lesions, you see, seen on mammography here, and all an ultrasound is circumscribed, see, with the close signs. This is typical of a dermal inclusion cyst. However, as we mentioned, even cancer can extend, you see, and infiltrating the skin, but there is absence of the close signs in this infiltrating cancer, which is very clear. We could see the lesions extending from the mammary zones into the subcutaneous, into the skin. Focal thickening definitely is pathological. Focal area of uh, calcifications, you see, this is dystrophic calcifications, is a, a pathological, usually seen with the scarring in uh, mammoplasty uh, breast uh, associations, and most of, the, most of the time is benign due to fat necrosis. But if we look here, definitely, the skin here is normal thin skin, but in the other sides, the skin is thickened, which is considered to be pathological, definitely not a normal skin. And in these examples here, this is normal skin, contralateral breast, definitely the skin is thickened. This is not a normal skin. Normal skin, thickened skin. This is even not well visualized the skin, the other one is enhancing and thickened definitely is an abnormal skin and in this case here compared to the contralateral breast the skin on mammography is thickened 
around the areol, around medial aspect. And this is ultrasound for the same patient compared to the, the uh, left breast to the right breast. Look how the skin here is thickened and losing even the normal anatomic morphology. And even here, not only thickened, but even I could not, we could not appreciate the uh, echogenic dermal and hypodermal from uh, dermal and epidermal and hypodermal from uh, from the subcutaneous fat. I mean, epidermal and, and dermal echogenic line from the hypodermal subcutaneous fat. There is lack of uh, tissue differentiations and sub associated with underlying subcutaneous uh, lymphatic uh, dilatations and increased vascularity. Definitely, this is pathology and not uh, a normal anatomy. We have to consider variations. See, there is something called caves of Cobans. These caves of Cobans representing the hypodermal radiolucency extending into the dermal uh, skin. You see, uh, as, seen, as seen here, these small, small hypo or radiolucent on mammography. And this is in the magnifying view, if we have seen it, this is not an abnormal, this is a normal variance representing a caves of Coban. It is about two to three millimeter radiolucency. And this is here on a mammography specimen. And this on MRI, this is a normal skin enhancement and there are small area non-enhancing uh, low signal area here seem uh, representing these in normal variants. Also, we have to consider uh, artifacts, especially with, uh, with using of synthetic mammography. And now, uh, just to, to reduce the effect of exposing the patient twice, doing uh, 2D digital mammography and doing uh, then uh, uh, doing 3D mammogram or uh, tomosynthesis. They are doing a tomosynthesis or the 3D. From the 3D, they are doing, they reconstruct into a 2D mammography and calling a synthetic uh, mammogram just to minimize the exposure of the patient. And with this synthetic, there are many uh, artifacts as seen here. Look for the skin, how it is thickened. And this is Allahumma uh, uh, salli uh, astaghfirullah This is also thickening here. You see, the, uh, in the sensitized mammography, and uh, in these patients here, down there is thickening, and the upper portion is even imperceptible. All these uh, are called burn. Uh, this is called as burn out. Uh, artifacts. Okay, we finish the skin going to the nipple areolar complex. Nipple areolar complex and perinipple structures which are areola, areolar gland and the nipple and it's really complex. It is a complex structures. It contains erectile muscles which cause uh, small muscles, which cause, uh, which is involuntary muscles, resulting in e e erections of the nipple or stimulations. So we have to remember leiomyomas in the differential diagnosis of nipple lesions. And the nipple and areola are uh, pigmented, you see, and the dots here are passing in a radial pattern into the nipples, the lactiferous dots in a spoked wheel, and the orientations of this ductal system toward the nipples, it has a significance for us as the radiologist in the lesion orientations. If we look here far away from the nipple area, this is a parallel lesion because it is long axis, is parallel to the skin. While this, we consider it 
as a non-parallel or vertically oriented because its long axis is vertical or obliquely oriented toward the skin. But when we came to the nipple area due to orientation of the ducts, obliquely oriented lesions, we are considered as a parallel. We are not considered as a non-parallel lesions. Okay. Still considering the normal anatomy of the nipples. We described before the development of the nipple and how the proliferations of the mesenchyme below the nipples causing yeah, the nipple to be to develop uh, and to get everted. But sometimes might fail to evert or slit like depression can occur on it as a congenital or uh, normal variations or developmental changes as also seen here. And because of the component of smooth muscle and fibrous component results in heavily shadowing on ultrasound. You see, we need to, 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 to put more gels and to have different technique to avoid this and to visualize what is going before below the nipples. And also uh, the nipples component uh, is abundant of lymphatic tissue, which we call, which they call it sabis plexus. And this also has a significance in uh, uh, lesions being close to the nipple, you see, or the nipple involvement by, by breast cancer is readily metastasized to the lymph nodes. And here, this is a MRI, this is the nipples, and this is the base of the nipple, and the shaft of the nipple is called a papilla. You see, also consider the assessment of nipple areolar complex. Um, its assessment is really important, as, you, as we mentioned before, is important for the staging, especially in the risk uh, breast cancer screening and you know that this its involvement is very important in uh, therapeutic planning and especially for those who they even if they, are, they want to do a mastectomy the nipple is sparing mastectomy it will not be the options of treatment if the nipple is being involved by breast cancer and that is why we have to understand the normal anatomy and normal morphology, normal enhancement on MRI, so as to differentiate what is normal from what is abnormal. We, we mentioned the nipples is con uh, that contains devoid fat, contain muscles and connective tissue. Uh, that is to include in the differential diagnosis and also we have to know that the ducts are passing. You see, the lactiferous ducts are passing into the nipple and even the epithelium of the ducts is in continuations with the epithelial of the skin of the nipples. And the significance of that is budget disease. You know the budgets, see, arising in these ducts and extending into the skin of the Nipple. Okay. Type. Uh, this, there is the nipple, it should be homogeneous. There is a lesion here within the nipple. It could be related to these dots or could be related to the. Uh, muscles or the connective tissue structures within the nipples. Also for the ducts, and as we mentioned, uh, the, the ducts, it should not be more than two millimeter and should be hypochoic. There is nothing should be seen within the ducts. Looking at the nipple itself, there is no added density should be. As is seen here, as if there is a micro calcification seen, but by repeating the image, you see, and clearing this area, 
this is it was an artifact rather than a calcification while in this case it is a true calcification and maybe a little bit enlarged this reflecting a pathological conditions the nipple should be bilaterally symmetrical should be seen on profile on and mammogram if it is not seen in one view in the other view it should be seen in profile and as we mentioned to be symmetrical when it is slit like depressions we, we said this is a, a retracted uh, nipples you see but being bilateral symmetrical this is most likely will be and there is nothing seen behind this most likely it will be a developmental on ultrasound nipple is really challenging is a challenging if we start by this it looks like a mass like it look like a pseudo mass it look like a, a not hypochoic with shadowing and this but when we compare with the mammogram look how it was perfect factual is not a real one here and uh, this is two examples you see the nipple look like a pseudo mass as well as in these lesions while here we could appreciate the nipple itself so it is a little bit flattened at the level of the skin you see not inverted but it's flattened but there is a true lesion definitely seen within the nipples and in these examples the nipple is retracted here you see asymmetrically retracted and there is abundant signal echoes uh, vascular echoes seen within and definitely this is a pathological uh, uh, nipples the nipple as we mentioned there are variations and it can be inverted it can be flattened it can be inverted this is inverted nipples on MRI simulating or mimicking an enhancing mass. It can be malpositioned. In this uh, mammogram here, the nipple malpositions giving apparent, uh, apparent uh, uh, small lesions. When repeating the mammogram here, this is a marker. It's seen the nipple in profile. Another, uh, another MRI here, this is spurious findings due to malpositions of the nipple itself, like on mammography, showing the nipple within the breast tissue as a pseudo uh, mass. The nipple morphology, mostly in 75%, uh, it's been inverted. However, it can be flattened and occasionally can be inverted. So, inversions, congenital inversions, with benign findings, usually reduce, redu uh, reducible. If we are doing the ultrasound, you might find it, it is being uh, uh, reverted in positions. You see? Uh, while physiological, usually fixed, and usually uh, is asymmetrical. And congenital nipple, usually bilateral. But in some percent, like 13% can be a unilateral and inverted nipple sometimes as we mentioned here can mimic uh, a lesion or a mass okay on mri these are bilateral inverted normal enhancing nipples see symmetrical is really important symmetrical symmetrical enhancement is important when we see normal yeah, and symmetrical size symmetrical enhancement inverted nipples mostly these are a benign uh, findings or a normal findings and the enhancement this enhancing uh, superficial enhancement is uh, a normal mri findings and rarely can be extending into the areolar area but when we see this it is usually seen in both Sides. and there is zone here of non-enhancement we call it non-enhancement zone it has to be present if there is internal enhancement you see to say this is a normal enhancement we need to see these zones 
and the enhancement can be patchy, the internal enhancement can be patchy or can be uh, linear, see? But definitely, this is asymmetrical enhancement. It's involving the base, it is continuous, is enlarging the nipples, see? Compare the two sides, asymmetric size, asymmetric enhancement, not following the, the routine, the usual pattern of normal enhancement. In a case of 32-year-old lady with, uh, presented with history of uh, family history of breast cancer, and that was uh, the presentations for her uh, malignancy, okay, picked by MRI. And this is also another patient of breast cancer. You see extending ductal carcinoma in situ, extending down into the nipple here. This is definitely, the continuation is obvious, and this is abnormal nipple enhancement, and this is not a candidate for nipple sparing mastectomy. Okay, considering the nipple areolar complex, the Montgomery gland is part of Yani, uh, an important issue we have to mention. From my experience, is really common, common, yeah, usual uh, problem in in coming to radiology department. Uh, even yani, almost almost every day, or every other day, or two or three per weeks, hmm, we receive patients complain of her nipple area and only we found that this is related to Montgomery gland. I don't know about the literature, they did not mention this is very common and I don't know if it is related to certain area more than the others um, area, but from my, my, my experience, it is, uh, a, it is a common presentation, you see, and these, uh, these Montgomery glands are sebaceous, are a modified sebaceous gland, considered as intermediate stage between mammary or milk gland and sweat gland, because it contains a small amount of milk, though this is not the exact function of which. It is function is containing a lubricant materials that contain even antibacterial agents, uh, and these glands are getting enlarged during lactation and pregnancy to lubricate the nipples for uh, and facilitate the, 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 the functions of suckling for the baby and protect the, the mother nipple from, from cracking and from being, get infected. Uh, however, this gland by itself, you see, sometimes it get, it is blocked, uh, get uh, blocked, it can be blocked. You see, as and and get inflamed. Are uh, they they open into the skin surface by what is called Morgagni or Montgomery tubercles? These here, these elevations, okay, into the skin or these bumps are the Montgomery elevations, and usually are not yani, getting large or getting present. You see, until pregnancy, it will become obvious. And there are variations between between female and the others. Some they have a lot, some they have uh, little of, of this, and they usually range from four to 25 on each side of the breast. And as we mentioned, getting uh, become noticeable during lactation. If you compare here, here are larger compared between these two female. And if you see here, there is, there is bright discharge from this due to milk. Tiny milk can be discharging from this, from this Montgomery gland. And even if it gets infected, can result in periareolar abscess as in our uh, case seen here. Okay. We finished the skin and uh, nipple areolar complex going to press parenchyma. And the parenchyma, it represents, as we mentioned, represents the glands. It forms mainly of 
dialectiferous ducts. Okay. Here, these are the lactiferous ducts going back into segmental, subsegmental ducts, ending into SNI or alveoli, forming the lobules. Okay. There are there are each breast having about fifteen to twenty lobes or sections. So we have about fifteen. To, to, uh, to 20 lactiferous ducts going toward the nipples. And these larger ducts, okay, dividing into segmental, subsegmentals, and going back, okay, to terminate in the terminal ductal lobular unit or the SNI. So we have many sections. Here we have many sections, and the sections, these are lobes. The lobes containing hundreds and hundreds lobules, okay? And the lobules contains multiple SNI and alveoli, which are the factory of the milk. And these sections are embedded into the, brain, the breast stroma and separated by the Cooper ligament or the fibrous septum. The ducts, the lactiferous ducts going toward the nipples is getting large here, forming the lactiferous sinus. And rarely this lactiferous sinus can be more superficial and rarely can be palpable. She might, the, the lady, she might palpate this lactiferous sinus, but this is not a usual presentation. And it should not be more than three millimeter. And the ducts, it should not be more than two millimeter. And it should be echo free, containing fluid, not containing any echogenic materials or hypochoic materials. These are examples of the uh, ducts. This is a ducts, galactiferous okay, ducts, and it's branching arborizations, but it's all. Uh, within the normal caliber. This is a normal ductogram. This is also normal ductogram, but this tiny, tiny nodule due to a lobular plush, plush normal plush due to uh, pushing the contrast, more contrast or with, uh, with pressure, the contrast pushed with pressure. But this MRI here representing a dilated ducts, you see, and this also mammogram with multiple dilatic ducts due to ductectasia. Again, this is mammogram with a dilated ducts. Same patient on ultrasound, demonstrate multiple dilated but echo free. So this is just a ductectasia, simple ductectasia, while the ducts here containing internal echoes. So definitely this is uh, yeah, this is a complicated type of ductectasia, not a simple ductectasia. This is this even size-wise is abnormal and abnormal more more complicated by internal uh, echogenic materials and the presence of increased vascularity in even in the periductal area consider an abnormality or pathological in this case of a periductal mastitis. And in the other patients here, this is a duct is dilated, considered abnormal on mammogram, and the corresponding ultrasound demonstrate intraductal material with intraductal vascular echo, signify this is to be a soft tissue in a case of babyloma. So the only normal is this ductogram, while the remaining are considered abnormal. So we have to know the normal to differentiate what is abnormal. Gross anatomy of the, gross anatomy of the female as uh, sorry, a stromal component of the, stromal component of the breast contain two parts, which is fibrous stroma and fatty uh, stroma. The fibrous, the fibrous stroma is the connective tissue you see, 
uh, uh, connective tissue and the ligaments. As we mentioned before, this uh, 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 provides support for the breast and the suspensory or the copper ligament extend from the skin and holding the breast to the uh, posteriorly to the pectoralis, giving support for the gland. And if these being infiltrated by the uh, by 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 breast cancers or by malignancy, it get triggered, it gets shortened, result in buckering of the skins, which can give the typical appearance of peel of orange or BD orange. You see, as seen here, this is a BD orange. You see, and this is thickened, diffusely thickened uh, cobra ligaments. These are the cobra ligaments or connective tissue are thickened due to breast edema on mammography as well as on uh, this MRI. Look how it is thickened, okay? While these on ultrasound, these cobra ligaments are normal, smooth uh, ligaments, echogenic fibers, not showing uh, any abnormality. Also can be focal, not always, uh, not necessarily to, so, to see throughout the breast. This is a malignant lesions, and these are the cobra ligaments due to perilesion, infiltration, lymphatic infiltrations, and edema are get thickened. You see, extending up to here while far away, still the breast is not getting uh, edematous and the cobra ligaments are not involved. And even the effect on the adjacent skin uh, is visualized. Regarding the fatty stroma, uh, the breast, as we mentioned before, the, the breast is a bag of fat. The, the, the major component of the breast is, uh, is fat. And the gland is being embedded into this fat. And as we mentioned before, the fat is black or radiolucent on mammography and uh, echolucent on or hypochoic on ultrasound but when there is a pathology the, the fat might get increase in density due to edema and very lesion edema as in this case and here there is the compare the fat lobule here on this normal uh, ultrasound and this fat lobule are getting large as well as become so echogenic. And even here, there is lack of differentiation, tissue differentiation between fat, gland, and skin due to diffuse breast edema and everything is getting echogenic. And here, this is a new plastic process causing this diffuse breast edema. Okay, the cobra ligaments, as we mentioned, uh, it should be thin, and well oriented, not distorted, not thickened, not increasing, uh, uh, not increasing size. Uh, this is normal cuber ligament. These are the cuber ligament in illustrations. These are cuber ligaments here on mammography. These are cuber ligaments, normal. But if we look here, these are cuber ligament a little bit thickened and associated with calcifications. So definitely, we consider this is a pathology. And here, there is distortion. The cuber ligaments here is distorted. And the adjacent contour of the fat glandular interface is also distorted. And this is, uh, this is uh, early mammogram, and this is follow-up mammogram. Now it's getting uh, increasing in size. And on MRI, demonstrate abnormal enhancement in a case of uh, malignancy. This and uh, look follow up following the follow up mammogram is usually uh, important to recognize any subtle findings regarding the breast anatomy, gross breast anatomy or radiographic anatomy. If you look here, this is the concavity of the of the fat glandular interface. In the follow up, there is a slight bulge here. And in one year, uh, in one year follow up, and another follow up, look for the bulge. 
So it is subtle, this bulge is subtle, and even the adjacent Cooper ligament are getting thicker in a case of, uh, of breast, evolving breast cancer. And this is a, a spot magnification view. Is not, is not disappear, it persistently present, and this is ultrasound demonstrate a lesion in a case of uh, evolving uh, breast cancers. Okay, breast like other structures having blood vessels and lymphatics, as well as uh, nerve, nerve system and so on, and the nerve supply of the breast is usually from the intercostal nerve. And just to remind that the secretory function is not controlled by this nerve supply, and it's controlled by the uh, hypothalamic pituitary uh, gonadal hormones rather than the nerve supply. Regarding the vascular supply, the two major vessels uh, of the breast are the internal branches of the internal memory and the lateral thoracic from the axillary artery. Uh, but there are others branches supplying the breast, the thoracocromial of the axillary, the lateral memory branch and the memory branch of the intercostal arteries. See, all these are supplying the breast and this is the MRI here demonstrate the internal memory branches going medially as well as this is the lateral thoracic artery. In this image, obviously the vessels are asymmetrically enlarged and increase, okay, increase in size and increase the branching due to the presence of this malignant mass compared to the contralateral. And on MRI, not only the vessels, if you look here, even the, the vessels are asymmetrically larger compared to the other side, and there is intense parenchymal enhancement compared to the contralateral, also reflecting increased vascularity in this size compared to the other size, also in a case of a breast carcinoma. Regarding the venous drainage, we have two uh, systems of, of venous drainage of the breast, the deep and the superficial, sorry, this should be the deep, the deep venous system and the superficial. Regarding the deep venous system is following the arterial uh, anatomy, see, same as uh, the arteries, the deep, the deep veins are following and draining into the parallel veins. While the superficial, which represent more of the main system or the major system, and is not, is unbared, is not following the arterial. And usually we have seen a superficial vein just beneath the skin on ultrasound. And this is usually a challenging, especially in a case of thrombophlebitis. You see, in the case of thrombophlebitis, sometimes the lady presenting with a tubular a tender a swelling mostly on the outer upper breast, you see. And when you put your probe, you might find the tubular uh, interrupted structures. You see, uh, you don't know if this is you, you might get conflict if it is adducts or a veins. And here usually the Doppler might, might help you and might show some flow in part of the veins because if it is get thrombosed, you might not see uh, uh, flow throughout uh, the veins. Also important uh, venous structures is, uh, we have to mention it here, is the posterior intercostal veins, which join what's called Paston venous plexus. And the Paston venous plexus is a network of valveless veins in the human body that connect the deep pelvic venous veins and the thoracic veins. 
is usually drain the inferior end of the urinary bladder, the breast and the prostate, to the internal vertebral venous plexus. So, the posterior intercostal veins join the azygous, hemiazygous system alongside the vertebral, see, alongside the vertebral, uh, vertebra here, okay, connecting to pa paston uh, vertebral plexus, which uh, go to the internal venous plexus surrounding the spinal cord because of the, their lap. Uh, their locations, I mean, and lack of valves. So, these, they believe that it is a way of spread of cancer to the vertebral column and to the nervous system, as well as to the skulls and the pelvic bones. So, the paston plexus is part of the cerebrospinal venous plexus. It's also considered the same way as uh, metastatic spread can be considered as a spread of the infection and osteomyelitis of the back from the pelvic infections and so forth. These vessels seen on mammography, lateral thoracic, it is normal size. Here, more dense due to calcifications. And this one is hugely dilated, even seen here on ultrasound. So we can put color doubler to visualize why it's hugely dilated. There is a lot of differential diagnosis for these dilatations regarding, regard, if it is either local process, okay, dilated due to underlying pathology in the breast and the, 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 the blood supply is increasing and new vascularity, or due to vascular anomaly, Itself, but most of the time is related to the more central venous obstructions. Like superior vena cava obstruction can also result in enlargement of the press vein as part of the chest wall uh, venous collateral and this uh, issue. And also due to engorgement, uh, central engorgement or chest pathology, sometimes we might find the breast is becoming edematous and it will result in a challenging if it is this edema is related to a venous problem or lymphatic problem central or systemic whatever or due to an inflammatory carcinoma especially because we could not appreciate or we could not find definite mass or pathology within the breast and this case here is a thrombophilipitis you see with the dilated vein seen on mammogram as well as on ultrasound. Okay, the most important part is the lymphatic system. And it is really of great clinical importance. Why? Because the lymph node involvement is the main prognostic factor. And independent of other factors like tumor size or kida or these for predicting overall survival and progression free survival. Nodal status also influence the thera uh, therapeutic indications and the tumor involvement of auxiliary node is an indication to neoadjuvant chemotherapy. Supraclavicular indication for radiation therapy the absence of clinical nodal involvement and uh, allow to consider option for sentinel node, see, procedures, and therapy avoiding unnecessarily surgical sections if the sentinel node is negative. Okay, so the main, the main lymphatic drainage of the breast is known to be toward the axilla. And so, look here, it's going toward the axilla. In these illustrations, we have many levels here. Level one, two, three, we have to understand. And we have seen here directions of the, of the lymphatics. So here, this is the axilla. We have seen here colored 
This is pectoral is major, pectoral is minor. Again, on the sagittal view, pectoral is major, pectoral is minor. And this is pectoral is minor on coronal, separating level three from this level one, and so on. Let us go through this one by one to understand. Before that, look here for these examples, see, of, of uh, auxiliary invasions on PET scanning. In the first example A, this is level one. See, external to the pectoralis minor, corresponding to TNM stage N1. This invasion of level one, external to pectoralis and level two, posterior to pectoralis, corresponding to TNM stage one, if lose not. If are clinically fixed, it will be stage N2. Okay. See, this is the pectoralis. This is lateral and this is medial. So we are talking about level 1 and level 3. So corresponding TNM N3. Ipsilateral supraclavicular TNM N3. So it is really important, really important to describe the nodal involvement by locations, by levels, which nodes is being involved. It will change the stage, okay, of disease process and definitely changing the stage will reflect for the therapeutic selections. Okay, let us go for the pectoralis and the three levels of the nodes. There are many levels of, there are many uh, groups of, uh, of lymph nodes in the pectoralis named by what and so, but for us, okay, uh, this is the most important uh, to describe the, the three levels and the rotors node, okay, from oncology and surgical point of view, just simplify things, these are the most important. This is a pectoralis minor. We said before the importance or the significance or relation of the muscles to the press, though the pectoralis minor is not directly in contact with the, with the press, it is behind the pectoralis major, but here it has so important clinical significance because uh, the levels of the lymphatics is being related to the orientation or locations of the pectoralis minor. If that it is lateral and inferior to it, which it is level one. If it is behind the pectoralis minor, it is level two. And if it is superior medial to which it is level three. Here in cross-sectional anatomy, this look, this might be CT or MRI. Look here, this is a pectoralis major and this is a pectoralis minor. Lateral to which is level one medial to which is level three, posterior to which is level two. In between the two pectoralis is the interpectoral or the rotor node. Okay, this is ultrasound here. This is pectoralis major and pectoralis minor. Okay, pectoralis major, pectoralis minor. So this is lateral and this is medial. We have level one and we have level three. And obviously these are malignant lymph node. Here, again, we have level one. No, this is medial here. This is level three and this is posterior level two. And this is supraclavicular lymph node, malignant lymph node. And this even retrosternal. So in expert hand, you see, they can visualize by ultrasound the retrosternal uh, mammary, internal mammary, uh, malignant node, but it is really challenging. Okay. As we mentioned, the dominant pathway of breast cancer is axillary, but there are alternate routes of lymphatic flow. Rarely it might go 
to the internal memory nodes, okay? Originate from both medial and lateral, though more commonly the medial aspect going and the internal memory even, see, cross the sternum to the contralateral breast. So it is one way of contralateral involvement from the, uh, through the internal memory pathway. Also, there is a retro memory pathway, see, from the deeper portion of the uh, breast to the subclavian plexus. This occur a little bit much more than the rest. When the usual lymphatic plexus blocked, there are other pathway can be open and uh, can be involved by the uh, spread of lymphatics, which include directly from the breast to the contralateral breast. And though this is rare, in my experience, I have a couple of cases I could trace the malignancy from medial aspect of one breast extending through subcutaneous, through the midline, cross midline into the contralateral breast. Also, the other way is cervical knots and peritoneal cavity and liver through the diaphragmatic pathway or the rectus sheath. Okay. Lymphatic drainage of the breast, look here, how it's so anastomosed. All, almost all pathways here showing a lot of anastomosis. And it's usually arising, the lymphatic arising here from the lobules, okay? It flows through the intramammary lymph nodes and intramammary lymphatic channels toward the space uh, uh, plexus in the subareolar regions. As we mentioned, this area is rich in the lymphatics and from these plexus going toward the axilla, either directly or through these chains of lymphatics. Lymphatics from the left breast is going to the thoracic duct and subclavian and on the right side to the subclavian vein. What is the clinical significance of this uh, anastomosis, a lot of anastomosis of the lymphatic pathway? What is the clinical significance for that? Any volunteer? Okay. This we can expect a sentinel node to be located outside the axilla which is the lymph node, which is defined as the fairest lymph node draining the tumor site. So it might be outside the axilla. And the development of lymphatic mapping is really essential, essential for visualizing the, this drainage pattern. And as we mentioned, for prognostic and therapeutic uh, purposes. Okay, as we mentioned, the press going to, to the axilla, level one, level two, level three, just to make it simple, these levels and sometimes infraclavicular node consider part of level three, from there going to supraclav, you see, and here this is the internal memory, and as we mentioned here, as we, the, these are anastomos, even this internal memory can go through the vessels, go up into to the supraclavicular regions. So we have group of lymph nodes of interest. We have to look at intramammary lymph node. Uh, in case of malignancy, sometimes we can notice that there is a malignant not or the, can be involved by, by the disease process when, the, when it is present in trauma memory uh, or present on imaging, I mean, the axillary lymph node, the three levels, one, two, and three, the rotors ligament, the rotors nodes, I mean, sorry, 
the supraclavicular and the internal mammary, contralateral, and the phragmatic nodes. Okay. So we know the, the, the pathway and the nodes, the interested nodes expected to be involved by the disease. We want to know when we say these nodes is involved or not. Starting by the ultrasound, which giving yani, a high sensitivity and specificity over the mammography and the clinical in evaluations of the uh, lymph, lymphadenopathy. This here, and long axis and short axis of an axillary lymph node in a short in a short axis seen as a C shape as seen here and long axis it has a rainy form or an oval shape with a central see hyper echoic uh, hilum and this is the echogenic capsules and part of the cortex and this is hypo or isoechoic uh, uh, cortex and here we have to mention that when the it is hypochoic it is isochoic sometimes it's difficult to be visualized within the axilla you need to use the harmonics okay to help the visualizations of uh, the lymph nodes so it by harmonic it might get a little bit hypo and could be differentiated from the adjacent fat of the axilla. And if we look here in both, the cortex is uniform and thin. It is less than three millimeter, considered to be normal. Three millimeter and above, we have to consider it as pathological. Okay, we have to know the anatomy, detailed anatomy of the lymph node to understand uh, the involvement of the lymph node by the disease process. The lymph node look like the kidney. It has the kidney shape, you see? It has the hyla through which the vessels is getting in and the efferent lymphatic vessels getting out. However, the afferents are multiple and getting into the cortex through the capsules. And just beneath the capsules, we have the cortex. And the cortex are two parts. We have a superficial, this is part of the cortex, and we have another, uh, a deep part of the cortex, and then the medullary portions. Okay. So it depends how much the cancer cells getting involved the nibble coming co getting involved the, the the lymph node coming to the lymph node through one single uh, uh, afferent or multiple afferent vessels in this case here is getting through one uh, afferent vessels into the subcapsular sinusoids going into the insides in the caps in the cortical sinusoids here within the cortex these are the lymphoid follicles okay and getting deep into the deep cortex then going deep deep then it, uh, to, till to reach the whole uh, the whole uh, lymph nodes or the hilum and uh, and the uh, central portions of the lymph nodes so the morphology is more important in evaluation of lymphatic lymph uh, of, uh, of uh, axillary lymph nodes or the metastatic lymph node rather than the uh, only the size. Size is not a, a, a predictor uh, factors. And also by using the doublers, can we will see how it can help us. Look here, this is. Uh, lymph nodes not much big but there is irregular cortical thickening you see in expense compressing the hilum in a case of malignancy and this how it is irregular cortex you see and here definitely this is peripheral cortical uh, vascularity new vascularity signify this is metastatic 
uh, or uh, pathologic metastatic or malignant lymph node rather than just reactive lymph nodes, though this lymph node demonstrate homogeneous or uniform cortical thickness, and still there is a peripheral fatty hilum, but look for the vascularity. This new vascularity signify this is a malignant lymph nodes. This is not a normal lymph nodes. And here, look for the late morphology. This is the same lymph node, follow up. It was in the short axis and long axis, then is getting in the long axis, getting more circular and then losing its normal uh, shape, normal textures, no even residual fatty hilum, and even losing uh, the, the capsules and infiltrating into the adjacent structures. So this is definitely malignant lymph nodes. This is our patient's bilateral reactive lymph nodes. Look. Yes, there is cortical thickening, however, is uniform cortical thickening, we still could appreciate some fatty hilum. And when you see the vascularity, so it is abundant vessels with much more arborizations, however, is going through the hilum, then uh, arborized into inside the lymph node reaching the cortex, not coming from uh, from the reverse, from the cortex, and coming. Look for this one. So that it is symmetrical cortical thickening. However, look for the cortical peripheral vascularity. And even here, this is the vascularity. These are definitely abnormal vascularity in a case of malignant uh, lymph nodes. Okay. Again, this small lymph node with here might be uh, suspicious for a small bulge in the cortex, but by putting the, uh, the color doppler, definitely this is a higher vascularity, but this is peripheral cortical, vert, peripheral cortical vascularity signify it is metastatic lymph nodes. Okay, these lymph nodes here, the cortex and the medulla, and there is another area Faint hypochoic. What do you think? Is it this hypochoic? Is it signify uh, infiltrations, malignant infiltrations? Definitely no. Why definitely no? Because the cortex is intact and it is always, always metastatic involvement is coming to the lymph node through the cortex. So we, that is why we need to know the normal anatomy, okay? And these and the relevant uh, related abnormality and pathway and this involvement and this issue to understand, uh, to differentiate normal from abnormal and even to differentiate between different types or the, of pathology itself. In this case, this is a medullary portions away from the cortex. The cortex is normal, definitely is not a malignant process, and the, 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 the lymph node is enlarged, and this is usually seen in the elderly patients due to repeated inflammations and uh, fat infiltrations, benign fatty infiltrations of this area result in this issue. Compare with this small lymph node, but here, the pathology is related to the cortex. This is uniform, but the adjacent lymph nodes, this I might say it might be reactive, but since the adjacent node is, is suspicious, so this is also a suspicious lymph node. Mammogram is not very sensitive for evaluation of lymph nodes, okay? Its sensitivity and specificity much less than ultrasound, but in advanced node, uh, definitely it will be uh, the suspicious effect it will be visualized and in this case this is a malignancy and definitely this is level one malignant lymph node and also these are dense uh, de very dense uh, lymph node with lack of fatty hilum compared to the contralateral lymph node and compared to this bilateral normal with thin cortex 
and abundant uh, lucent fatty hilum. However, in this our case, if we look here, look for the mammogram, there is large area of fatty hilum, okay, seen here, as if this is large lymph node and this a fatty hilum. But compared to the ultrasound here, these are multiple adjacent lymph nodes with irregular cortical thickness and even indistinct borders. And that was the only abnormal findings, see, could be appreciated in this young lady having metastatic disease. Look, compare with this in the literature. This is reported as a normal, typical normal lymph node. Same as this lymph node, but that was uh, proven, pathologically proven metastatic lymph node. This is the same patient here. See, before looking for this same patients, the CT is also helping us in evaluations of the lymph nodes and giving overview for almost all levels, axillary levels, and even characterizing characterization of the lymph node itself. Look for this lymph node is almost same size or even larger than the index breast tumors. Our patients, we have seen her mom just now. You see, look for this lymph node. Though are not much larger, but if we compare to the contralateral, definitely these are heterogeneously enhanced, lacking the fatty hilum, and there is very nodal edema. See, and we report these are uh, as uh, suspicious lymph nodes, and the patient in this patient having uh, metastatic bone disease, and we raise the suspicions for for the breast carcinoma, looking deep into the breast, we could appreciate only this small lesion and it was the source for extensive uh, metastatic disease and this axillary malignant node and all uh, were proven uh, pathologically. MRI is even more sensitive and is specific than ultrasound in evaluations the uh, malignant uh, axillary lymph nodes differentiating from B9, even with early low level of suspicions, definitely this here I mean, is obviously a metastatic or malignant type of lymph node, distorted, rounded, or global with uh, lacking of fatty hilum and intense enhancement. However, in this case, with, uh, with left breast cancer, at this level, See, bilateral comparable with abundant fatty hilum and thin uh, cortex. It doesn't show uh, as any level of suspicions. But going down, this is post contrasty one while these are T2, definitely these are asymmetric compared to the other sides with some cortical thickness. And this was suspicious and proven to be a neoplastic or metastatic lymph nodes. Okay, this pectoralis minor, pectoralis major, you see, and the chest wall, so we are dealing with which level of, which level, we are dealing with which level of lymph node, and this is the same patients here. Huh? Level two. Which level? No volunteer? Level two. Level it's posterior one. to the pectoralis. So it will be level two. No answer? Level two. Okay. It will be level two. We said lateral to the pectoralis is level one. Pectoralis minor. Posterior to the pectoralis minor is level two and medial to the pectoralis minor is level three. Okay, so here, this is the pectoral group, vessels, and this is the lymph node on ultrasound. This medial aspect, here is lateral, and this 
the lymph node, this is the vessels. Here, this is the pectoralis minor. So this is not the lymph node. This is not lymph node. The lymph node are here. So it is, this is the thickest part of the pectoralis. So, and this is the shoulder. So this, it will be level. These are external, are lateral. So this, it will be level one. one. Okay. This is level one. And what about this one? Which level? Level two. Anyone would like to answer? Any volunteer? Level two, this is posterior. If we look for the structures, what are these? What are these structures? This two. contrast study T1. These are the ribs. And this is the intercostals Internal muscles. Memory. So this is, it will be, this is the breast, and this it will be internal memory vessels. Yes. So this Level lymph three. node definitely will be Level 3. The internal memory node. See? And the other one, this one, is axillary lymph node. Okay, so in large lymph nodes, uh, and they mentioned that metastasis is to internal mammary lymph node. In the presence of axillary, they consider it entry, or uh, and it will change the the stage two, stage three C. Okay, what about this case? This the lymph node here very large lymph node and look for the lesion itself very small lesions what is your explanation for this or why why very small lesions giving this huge axillary lymph nodes the metastasis is larger than the lesion itself so it, it's early metastasized. Why is early metastasized? Look for the location of the lesions. It is in the retroareolar region. It's close to the nipple areolar complex where the abundant lymphatic system. And so early metastasis. Okay. What about these patients? This extensive malignant process within the breast. The CT, this is level one, and this is level three, and this is hepatic metastasis. So, it is almost stage four, this metastatic disease. Okay. So we finish the gross anatomy and we said the glands, this is the glands, you see, and the adjacent stroma, fibro, fibroglandular, representing the mammographic hyper or radio opaque structures and loosened area, the intervening fats, okay? And we mentioned that the breast composed of about 15 to 20, 25 lobes or functional unit, more or less separated by, uh, like by, by fibrous septa or the uh, cobra ligaments. And within each loops, we have many lobules, hundreds and hundreds lobules, and the lobules contain small units, okay? These small units, we call it uh, al uh, alveoli or the acini. See, the smallest unit is acini, and representing the functional, the functional part or the factory of the milk, and these the ducts are arranged into spokes wheel toward going toward the nipple, okay? 
And if you look here, the ducts, central ducts, are going direct to the chest wall while the others are going into the radial uh, patterns. And uh, the, previously, they mentioned that these, these segmental ducts, segmental and subsegmental ducts, are interdigitating, are, and they, they believe, before they believe that, uh, are interconnecting. But uh, current studies dispute this uh, anastomotic effect, and they mention that are only interdigitating due to lack of true anatomical separation. Yes, there is septation, there is fibrous septum, there is Cooper ligament passing between the lobes and even between the lobules, but it is not a true anatomical boundaries between these segments and the, the, the segmental uh, ductal uh, structures are passing from one uh, segment to the other segments. So, okay, going more toward the microscopic structures of the breast, we talk about the ducts, the lactiferous ducts. We said that the lactiferous ducts then it get branched into segmental and subsegmental, and these subsegmental going uh, into smaller ductules. And these ductules forming, uh, the, these ductules representing the alveoli, and collectively the cluster of these forming what is called a lobule. And as we mentioned early in the development of the breast, we said rudimentary breast start uh, in triatrine by developing only ductal system. But at pubertal period, due to hormonal stimulations, the, these ductal branchings getting complex, developing more complex um, or, uh, organogenesis or more, more complex ductal formations, and then formations of this terminal duct lobular unit. So what is terminal duct lobular unit? It is this area of lobules or cluster of alveoli and within these alveoli there is intralobular terminal ducts, see, intraductal terminal, and these are drained into extraductal terminal, uh, terminal ducts. The extraductal terminal ducts the, the, the proximal one along with this lobule together forming what is called terminal duct lobular unit, which is uh, influenced by, by, by hormone as we mentioned, and this is the important site, site for uh, breast uh, proliferations and benign as well as malignant breast diseases. And as we mentioned before, this is the factory of milk productions. See, this is the factory of the milk productions. And if you note here, you notice that this lobule is surrounding by this color representing a special type or a specialized type of connective tissue stroma containing capillaries. All this, it has significance regarding the breast pathology. And since this development of uh, the influence of the, of the hormones and developments of more uh, lobular duct, uh, terminal duct lobular units occur during pregnancy, the, the theory uh, is, uh, uh, describes that there are stem cells at these terminal ducts responsible for the formations of these uh, terminal duct lobular unit and since occur repeatedly during pregnancy it might stay up to 60 percent and they consider these uh, might be uh, a precursor for a breast cancer uh, development also okay during pregnancy look for the terminal duct lobular unit and the surrounding stroma of a normal lady non-lactating lady and see it here during lactation, how it's getting proliferating and enlarged both the stroma as well as the epithelial portions. Okay, so going more uh, microscopically, 
into these structures. This is the duct, and these are lobules. You see the ducts, and this is a lobule. If we are taking this here, uh, this is the acinal. This is the acinus, the ducts, the looming, and this is the acinus. So there are two layers of epithelial cells. The inner layer, call it the luminal cells, which is the secretory cells secreting the milk, and the outer layer is the myoepithelial cells which is the basal, considered to be the basal myoepithelial cells, which is the smooth muscles responsible for the ejections of the milk, okay? And uh, the outer layer is the basement membrane, which is not interrupted, and this determines the differentiation between the inside carcinoma, you see? which does not passing outside the base membrane to the invasive cancer, which infiltrating into the basement membrane. And the presence of these multiple types of cell system cells, the ductal and the lobular cells also uh, form of luminal cells as well, maybe cellular cells, reflecting the cancer heterogeneity in terms of cell origin. Uh, okay, the terminal duct lobular unit we said is the commonest place for the formations of, for the benign as well as a uh, breast cancers. And breast carcinoma, DCIS, lobular fibroadenomas, and phylloides, breast cyst, epicrine, metaplasia, adenosis, fibrocystic, all these are okay at the terminal duct uh, lobular units. And here, this at the level of terminal duct lobular unit, look for this is a normal, while this here is a cyst, and these examples of different types of pathology, while the babyloma usually arising in the main ducts, you see, and ductal hyperplasia also is a ductal lesion here, but uh, the fibrous and fibroadenoma, sclerosing, and DC are at the level of the terminal duct lobular units. These examples, ductogram, you see, demonstrate the dilated ducts, but the peripheral terminal duct lobular units are, doesn't show any uh, abnormality on this ductogram. This is again a dilated duct with internal uh, lesions demonstrate vascularity in a case of intraductal babyloma. Going further, the ductogram here demonstrates these small, small, small uh, contrast, rounded or oval areas of contrast, plush into the terminal duct lobular unit, but are small, are tiny, are not enlarged just due to plush of contrast due to pressure. It represents normal terminal duct lobular unit, while these terminal duct lobular unit in the, the other examples, look how it is dilated in a case of a fibrocystic uh, disease. And here, this is a normal, but are numerous are much, a lot of, a lot of terminal duct lobular units. That is why looking as, as if it is dense a mammogram, but it is, it is a ductogram and there are numerous terminal duct lobular unit, more glandular uh, pressed, but these is still within two millimeter or less in diameter representing a normal terminal duct lobular unit. While these illustrations or this photograph of a histo histology uh, image, demonstrate here this is this a normal terminal duct lobular unit, while this definitely enlarge terminal duct lobular unit, and this acini within the terminal duct lobular unit also enlarge in a patient with a fibrocystic. Okay, 
What is your observation just regarding the gross anatomy of the breast in this case? Just we are trying to apply the gross anatomy on breast imaging. What is your observations, huh? Volunteer, so here is not there? If you don't like to participate today? Don't like to contribute? Hello? No one is there? Okay. So, this is obviously here, we have asymmetry. When the right breast is significantly smaller not in profile, to the left breast. If we concentrate even, there is subtle change in the contour here and there is some thickening in the periareolar skin. There is some distortion in the contour and there is thickening of the areolar skin. So, might reflect pathological process. Going further, this is dense breast. Going further, so the pathology at this level is asymmetry in the breast size. Going further to MRI, it's obviously here the asymmetry. The right breast is smaller compared to the left one and demonstrate intense non extensive non regional or non mass like enhancement and biopsy revealed invasive lobular carcinoma and compare the mammogram with the earlier one uh, this asymmetry it was not there so not always mammogram that not always cancer result in enlarged of the breast can also result in contractions uh, uh, of the breast and uh, which make it getting uh, smaller. And this asymmetry, but there is nothing associated with, uh, with, uh, with, with this asymmetry. The left one is significantly smaller compared to the right. However, the parenchyma and the uh, fat and the skin and everything doesn't show any uh, abnormality. So it, since there is no abnormal uh, abnormality associated with this asymmetry is virtually always will be developmental. And uh, usually, as you know, during puberty, early on, in early stages, there will be asymmetry. But when the, we reach stage four and five, then the asymmetry disappear and uh, both breasts more or less getting to be uh, more near symmetrical. Uh, however, if any persisting asymmetry, then it might be getting uh, increased this asymmetry if the lady gaining weight and more fat accumulating can give more uh, the, the asymmetry appear more uh, disproportionate between the two breasts. Okay, what about this? This is a uh, skin lesions. No one is there? These are skin lesions. No comment? Could be also cysts? Fibrocystic disease. No one would like to share. Fibrocystic disease, multiple cysts. Hello. Are you up? Doctor, people are answering, okay. but you are not listening. If they are answering. Here, if we they are answering, here, but you are not listening. These are bilateral numerous obesities. But looking carefully, some of these lesions are related to the skin. So are superficials, are skin lesions. This, because it is 2D, 
are the skin lesion are projecting over the breast and even here projecting over the over the axilla in a case of multiple skin lesions reflecting what neurofibromas neurofibromatosis okay but the challenge is here Do you, within this multiple lesion there is an speculated lesion here which represents a carcinoma so uh, in neurofibromatosis when there is increased risk of breast cancer by factor of five over the general populations okay this is a neurofibromatosis with breast cancer in conclusion uh, we talk about the breast anatomy, cross anatomy, resting over the pectoralis, relation to the adjacent uh, structures and muscles, and the breast covered, invested within the superficial layer of superficial fascia covered by the skin. We talk about the nipple areolar complex, the ducts going back, forming the glands or lobules, you see these are the ducts here and these are the lobules and the lobules contain also ducts okay and uh, the gland is embedded into the stroma and fats and we talk about conveys into extralobular terminal ducts, then going toward the lactiferous ducts and multiple lactiferous ducts reflecting the underlying breast segments, which about 15 to 20 are conveys to the nipple area. And we, get, we differentiate some of the normal and abnormal uh, uh, breast, uh, breast changes and at the end we can say as with all organs understanding of anatomy of the press lead to an enhanced ability to interpret imaging studies and the press imaging primarily involves the assessment of morphology of macroscopically visible press structures however basic understanding of the anatomy and histology of the breast and the complex underlying microscopic structures in which changes take place is an important for understanding the pathological process and all will help in image interpretations and generally the radiologists are pattern readers we are all pattern readers however rather than just searching for a pattern interpretations should be tried to understand or interpreter should be try to understand the underlying process that pursue, produce these morphological changes uh, and give these various uh, imaging studies and the different process might produce similar findings but getting deep into morphology and histology and uh, pathological changes uh, by understanding the anatomy of the press and organization and distribution of these histological elements, it will shape uh, the imaging findings. Ideally, the interpreter should be able to explain using a specific criteria why a finding is judged a benign or a potentially malignant by being able to explain the specific characterization of the findings uh, can lead to particular assessment. And also this understanding of the anatomy will help us in cross correlation the internal press anatomy for localizing press lesions in different imaging modality. Thank you very much.